Good afternoon. This is the elementary school coordinators assessment coordinators meeting for January 2024. Uh, it is a snow day, so I'm going to record this and let this uh, play out for you. If you have questions, there's going to be resources and documents that will allow you to um, ensure that you're able to get the information that you need. So let me begin by sharing uh, my screen. And we're going to get into the slideshow. All right. So January 9th, 2024. Here's what we're going to cover today. We're going to, again, go through some of the resources about how to contact us as well as our office hours. We're going to focus on the assessments coming up. We are finishing up the um, access for ELL. So I want to go through some of the process for that. We'll touch base on the winter screeners spend the most of the time on the forward exam, and then we'll wind up with our just a touching base on dynamic learning maps, which is will also begin the same day that the forward exam begins. So there will be a chance to ask questions, but in a different way today, um, as we're doing this in a recorded fashion, there is a question and answer, answer document that you can add to, and we will be monitoring that and follow, following up with you as quickly as possible. So again, the team who's here to help you, uh, myself, Sarah Walner, and Jamie Anderson are all on the assessment team. Stacy Will has the, uh, the student services portion covered, accommodations and 504s. If she doesn't know the answer, she can certainly find it quickly. Ben Kolosh is someone who is connected with all things multilingual. So you want to make sure if you have questions about supports for English learners, he is the person to touch base with. And then what do you do with all the data that we collect? So the local improvement team led by Lindsay Mitchell, Lauren Lauder, and John Rivolzi are all um, at your beck and call to come and help support you and decisions around the school improvement process um, with, with the data that we get from these assessments. So let's talk about some of the resources that you have available. First of all is our website. This is being updated on a regular basis. Uh, there are resources for both you and for the families, your families, how-to documents especially, and there's also the assessment coordinator's web page that's got things specifically like this meeting will be recorded and posted there, documents about uh, that we discuss will be posted there, etc. Keep in mind that we have office hours every day, uh, every Monday, excuse me, two to three for our department. And here's the link. We'll also have the link in the notes and the agenda. Uh, and if you don't find it there, you can certainly connect with any of us and we'll get that to you. All right, take a deep breath. Here we go. As we're almost ready to finish up with access testing, there are some details we'd like you to know. So first of all, We've, we've done a whole lot of work and especially you and your team. So I wanna just point out that a lot of this is done. We're just in the finishing up phase now. Keep in mind that anytime a student enrolls, we're gonna still follow the same process as we always do. Number one, student enrolls, um, they take the home language survey or you administer that. And if it indicates the student is a potential English learner, you go through the process with WIDA screener. Once that is scored, and if it indicates the student is, in fact, an English language learner, then if they arrive prior to January 19th, we would expect that there's time enough for you to give them the access test. If they arrive January 19th or after, uh, we're going to say no, that is not the case, um, unless you really want to, but we can wait for another year for the next year for, for the access test. Uh, so please make sure that if you have questions about when a student arrives and if you have to test them, um, like because I know what goes into testing, the amount of time it takes and energy. So we want to make sure that you are well aware of that and um, can be all, all set and taken care of. Also, what's up on the agenda is when we look at the calendar for the rest of this semester until the window closes, um, we're back from break. Uh, we've got next Monday. The 15th was the celebration of Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And then shortly thereafter, about a week and a half after that, we have the close of the window and close of the semester. So this is uh, 
coming up pretty quickly. If you have questions, concerns, uh, uh, if you're running into problems, please don't just sit back and hope they go away. Help, let us help you help them out, help you out. So please contact us if there are issues. One of the things I would like to point out is that uh, as you return materials, and usually it's going to be the writing booklets, it'll be uh, administration guides, it'll be everything that, that comes to you with the exception of the tickets, put them all back into a yellow box and send them on to us at Doyle. So pay, uh, send them to Sarah Walner's attention at Doyle. Um, make sure that before you close up that box, you go through the booklets. Uh, we can't have paper stuck into them. Um, check the back first on the front. If there's a label, uh, the student ID label, awesome, great, you're ready to roll. If there is not a label, for instance, they arrived after the cutoff date for uh, DPI to complete this, uh, then you will need to bubble in the back of the booklet. Uh, and one of the things you will need to have is the student state ID. That can be found not in IC, but rather in AMS. And we'll talk about where to find that in just a moment. As I said, return unused materials, uh, administration booklets, all kinds of things, send them back to us, but just do not send us tickets. And we'll take care of getting that off to the DRC for scoring. Now, if you need to add, bubble in the sheets in the back, um, you need to be able to get a hold of the student state ID number. Here's where you find it in AMS. Number one, log into AMS, and then go to test management. So that would be in the, the uh, drop down menu that uh, gives you choices, uh, test management. Set up your school, the test, which is access for L's and the year, then click on registered students because this student is already in, enrolled and in place. Once you've done that, you can search in the, use the search box um, by name. And when you have the name, it will automatically pop up the student state ID, the state student ID. So hopefully you'll be able to get that, fill that in, bubble everything in. Um, it really, yes, it takes you a while to do that. I understand that. But imagine now uh, 32 elementary schools coming back. And if each one of them had 10, that's 320. That's a lot of bubbling for us to do. So please, please, please complete the bubbling portion of, of the booklets if they don't have a student ID label. Now, one of the other things that's going on is as this year, there's been a change that the um, completion rate, the completion uh, portion of, the, of AMS shows that you haven't done any of the writing portion in grades one, two, and three. And that's because, again, it's not done online. You're in booklets. So what will happen is when those booklets get sent in, and you can send them to us at any time now. Um, if you're finished, send them to us. When we get them to DRC, the, the vendor, they then put in that they receive these and they're set for scoring. And those red bars that you see here for writing would disappear. They'd become green. Now, before that happens, I need to report to not only you and your principal, but I also just give updates to the associate superintendents. They want to know how everybody's doing. And so I have created a, a new document that removes the handwriting component for grades one, two, and three. And, and so you get a better picture of how far you're progressing, how far you're, you're, you're working towards um, uh, hundred percent participation. So now I'm going to be sending out a spreadsheet in the not too distant future that will list those students who have yet to, to complete the test. You may have students who are, um, who you know will not complete the test. I need to have a reason to put into the AMS software about why a student is not going to be completing the test. So I'll be asking you to complete that for those students that remain on your, your list and um, 
then I'll get that taken care of. And once that's done, all your material sent back, you're pretty much finished. So I'll get that out to you in the next week. Now, moving on to Meteor Screeners. As far as the elementary school is concerned, the only mid-year screener that's out there is our FastBridge screening um, in ELA, uh, as well as for those of you who are doing mathematics, that's available as well. The window is closing next week. And remember that the data gets pulled into EduClimber very rapidly. So you'll be able to get your big picture data uh, from EduClimber shortly. That includes classroom level, it includes grade room, grade level and school level data. So that window closes up on the 19th. We'll be pulling data after that uh, for upload into IC and any and uh, uh, the data dashboard for the district. So please keep that in mind. All right. Now, what you've been waiting for is what's going on with the forward exam for 2024. As I've alluded to it, there are changes. So those of you who have not lived through forward, let's go back and just kind of quickly summarize this. The state mandated exam is called the Wisconsin Forward Exam. Um, it measures progress towards the state standards. It also is used for ESSA or federal accountability as well as the school, uh, state school report card. So multiple ways that it's used for accountability. All students, let me repeat that, all students are expected to take the forward exam, unless they are, per their IEP, um, being taught to the essential element standards, which is a different set of standards, in which case they will take the dynamic learning maps or the DLM. There is no uh, excusing a student because they in, in an IEP, um, so there has to be something that, that students will take. Otherwise, every student um, is expected to take the test. Now, next month, we'll get into specifics about uh, exempting certain um, English language learners that are new to the country. We'll talk about in greater depth um, opting out and other options. I mean, if a student is in a hospital and uh, can't participate, we get it. And so there are, we'll talk about that next in next month's meeting. But right now, we need to continue to focus on the fact that this is going to be computer-based. It is not adaptive, and we are going to be using the student Chromebooks that they have available to them. So the name of the site, as you can see, uh, the, the illustration here is called the DRC Insight Portal. It's very similar to DRC AMS, uh, which is the Access and WIDA Screener Portal. It looks and behaves very similarly. It is not, it has not been updated to be exactly the same as the WIDA site. So that's, this should be a little bit uh, easier for those of you who have done this before. So what gets tested? English language arts, mathematics at every grade. So in elementary school, English language arts and mathematics in third grade, fourth grade, and fifth grade. In addition to that, fourth grade will have sessions in science and social studies. So those are the, the content of the test. That's the content of the test. It must be given in person. And that was much less of an issue today than it was several years ago. But it, keep in mind that just because a student is in Madison Promise um, means doesn't mean that they are exempted from taking the test. The window this year opens on March 18th, which is a week, approximately a week before the MMSD spring break. It closes on the 26th of April. This is the state window. I cannot extend it for you. Um, and it closes on the 26th of April. So there are six weeks in the window, one week of which we are on spring break. Class link is not an option. So students will be getting, you will be getting tickets for students. They will need to use the tickets to get into the, into the, the uh, forward exam. You'll get those somewhere around the second week in March. So a week prior to this, the window opening, you'll get the tickets. There's a lot of work that has to go into this prior to getting you tickets. So just please understand that it's not simply a matter of us now printing tickets and holding on to them. 
There's more to it than that. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, I did work, I've worked with tech services, uh, continue, we have a great relationship with them, but today, they actually, in my meeting with them, they actually said the one thing that was a problem during the uh, access testing was especially at younger grades, students have not really used their Chromebooks. Not an issue, but it's a reminder for you that Chromebooks need to be current, they need to be updated. And that happens when they're actually used because they update their, themselves upon restart. So when you open up a Chromebook and you're able to look at it, so you open up the lid, it turns on, and during that login process, if you look in the upper right-hand corner, it'll say Chrome OS and then give you a number. The number should be literally the best number uh, the operating ver system version is 118, 118. It needs to be above 114 or 114 in order for the a test to work. So restart the machines, make sure that, um, that they are at the current process. Now, Tech Services also told me that if the Chromebooks have not been used for a while, it's best to open them up and start them and let them go for a while. So literally it might be an hour and then restart them um, and, and you'll get that, that restart automatically. So, but once you've done that, the Chromebooks are set up to, to refresh every, every Monday. Please do this before the test window. Once the test window gets here, uh, tech services will lock all progress and updates and will not allow updates to happen. Um, that's for many reasons, including we don't want to have a technical update in the middle of testing. And so it might work today, but not work tomorrow. So to avoid those kinds of things, tech services kind of locks everything up. So please make sure that your Chromebooks are up to date. Now, coming your way, uh, next week, uh, January 16th through the 19th, you are going to be getting a student roster. And in that, and this is for the forward exam, and on that roster will be several pieces of information. Number one, it will have uh, not only your ELLs, but it'll also have the students with accommodations, the, the students with disabilities in your building, 504s, that information will all be there. Um, and it's not for you to go in and double check every student to make sure that it is, is correct because we're pulling this from the OASIS system that, that staff members, CC teachers, case managers are using to create the IEPs. So the information that's there is correct. What we're looking for are students who have IEPs that need to be updated, that there's nothing there for them in the, the assessment tab, the I-7. Um, so please make sure that you understand we're not asking you to go in and check on every single student. There will be places that are blank and we need to know um, what is there. Because once testing starts, um, if we catch it before a student actually begins an assessment, it's easy enough to change. But once they've started, it's very difficult to change. And we may have to go to DPI depending on the assessment and how far they are. Um, or in order to get things um, restarted. It may mean throwing away all the work they did, and we want to avoid that. So uh, keep in mind that this list will also include those students uh, who are enrolled at your school who are also attending Madison Promise. Because this needs to be done in person, we need to reach out to those students in Madison Promise and make sure that they are um, invited to uh, take the assessment. Now, whether that means they come to your building, we find a neutral third site, but it has to be proctored and it cannot be done at home um, with a parent proctoring. If you have questions about that, please connect with me. Andrew Stendhal is the person at uh, Madison Promise who is coordinating all this. He can get you in touch with families. Um, great person to work with. And uh, I appreciate all his efforts that he goes through. 
So you'll need to work with your grade level teams as well to determine what English language learner supports are available and what are appropriate. And we'll get this back approximately Feb February 15th. So we're gonna give you some time to work on this, not trying to rush you at all, but we will give you a deadline and we'll kind of follow up on it. The reason why that we need to get this information is because we have to manually put information into AM, excuse me, DRC Insight the platform in order to set up accommodations for students. So that is a long, slow process. And if you want tickets prior to the test, um, they will, it requires us to get this information. Now, what's changed this year? What remains the same? So first of all, something that I wanna point out, this has remained constant throughout. These test sessions are not timed. The times that we're going to be looking at are suggested times based on past performance of students over the course of all the forward exam sessions at that grade level in that content area. So what has changed is that English language arts used to be four sections or sessions, um, including the text-dependent analysis, and it's text-dependent analysis no longer is a part of the assessment. That is gone. There are only three sessions for English language arts. So the time is cut just a little bit. Um, it's cut about five or so minutes. It still is a lot of work to do. There are three sessions and this is the session. English language arts is uh, what we should be doing first prior to any other portion of the test. There are two, there, excuse me, the first session is, is a reading session. The sessions two and three are English language arts, so it involves writing as well as uh, uh, grammar, et cetera, sentence, punctuation, structure, et cetera. So um, we are asked by DPI to do the, the write, ELA writing sessions two and three soon enough and get those completed um, early in the, in the window so that they can be scored because that is a human scored uh, process and it does take some time. There are two sessions of math. Uh, there are three sessions of science and two sessions of social studies. Science and social studies again is for fourth grade students only. Now let's take a look at the approximate times. So here you can see the approximate times it takes for each of the grade levels and again, these are estimated times because the test is not timed. So English language arts is approximately 125 minutes for the three sessions. Mathematics is 90 for the two sessions. Science for fourth grade for the three sessions, 105. And the two sessions in social studies for fourth grade is 70 minutes. Now let's break down that English language arts portion. You can see that for third graders, well, for all three, three, four, and five, the first two sessions are the longest at 45 minutes each. So we'll take a look at an example of a reading session question coming up. We'll also point out where you can go online to get the, the practice test. So reading and first session, excuse me, session two, language and, and writing are the longest. Session three is a little bit shorter. If you're a fourth grader, um, you have these additional times, but I wanna to touch base on mathematics. Again, the two sessions are 45 minutes each, total of 90 minutes. Uh, these sessions can be done in any order. They are not dependent on one another. You don't have to do one before two. It makes sense so that students can actually you know, say, all right, do session one, they're used to that order, the sequential order. Um, but if something happens and you end up doing session two first, it's fine. Science, again, th three sessions, but they're all 35 minutes each for fourth graders, and as well as the two sessions in social studies. So those are the changes. And the big change is what happens in English language arts this year. Now, here's an example of a question um, from session one reading. It is a comprehension test. So uh, one of the things that we're gonna talk about in a moment is the fact that now text-to-speech 
is a universal tool for all students, except on the reading passages of ELA session one. So let me point this out. So this section does not have a, um, a component that will uh, allow you the text-to-speech to work. Sorry, I'm just trying to figure out. Um, there we go. Sorry. <laughs> new tools, new places to go. Uh, so that section will not be read by text-to-speech. Everything else from the instructions, the prompt, the answers will be read by text-to-speech. Okay. Uh, text-to-speech is this box in the center. I would strongly urge you to try this out in the a practice test and we'll take a look at where that can be found um, and we'll talk about that more in in the near future but this is the reading comprehension to go to the next page you simply click on the side of the page that you want it to turn so if you click on this side the right side of this page it'll go to page two if you are in page two and you want to go back you can click on the left side and it will go back all right Let's go to session two. This is an English language arts. There is um, a still some reading. There's three pages, it's shorter, but as you can see, there is a long, longer, uh, there is a writing portion. It's expected that students do a good full paragraph, but this is not the only question in this particular section. After this, there will be several others that get into punctuation, et cetera. Here in sessions two and three, text-to-speech will read everything to the student. So it will read the passage, it will read the instructions, and it will read the prompts and the answers. Obviously, it will not read what they write, but it's there. There are some editing tools available, as you can see in the middle of this gray bar in the middle of the page. That's something to, to play around with if students have not done that kind of work before. Session three uh, begins with a just writing a paragraph. Again, it's not about responding to a reading to a uh, reading a passage. It's responding to what is in this particular upper portion. So it's a, again looking for one paragraph and text to speech will read everything. It is not the only question here, but there are much fewer fewer far fewer questions here than in the other two sections. All right, here in the uh, slide deck, you will find a link to the practice test. It will take you directly to that. It will look something like this. Uh, it can be used by anyone. This will be shortly, it will be located on the uh, uh, public facing webpage for the assessment team under the forward test. It will also be on the, the staff only side. Use it, uh, share it. Uh, we want people to know and understand what it is this test. Um, don't spend hours and hours with your students on this because that's not going to get them uh, to the point where it takes, makes them understand what the questions are any better. Uh, but students should be aware, especially because of the text-to-speech change, um, they should be able to look at this and know what the, where the tools are. So for instance, here I've set it up so that you can see that there is I clicked on the math versus the ELA, uh, but you can see a couple of the options, the practice test, what, what happens when you have color choices in this background or text masking. And then we'll be talking in a moment about stack translations, what that has changed this year as well. All right, let's review the accommodations and supports for students. There are three levels. The first one is called universal supports, and it's for all students. There's no need for any kind of decision process. Uh, there's no IEP, no 504, no, uh, no language plan. Um, all students get these things. Some of them are embedded in the software. Some of them are not. So those are called non-embedded. Examples of non-embedded would be scratch paper. 
when appropriate. Graph paper might be appropriate. When you use scratch paper or graph paper, remember that as soon as a student writes on it, it's considered secure material. You cannot let that go out the door. Um, it needs to be collected and shredded. However, here's the change, a couple changes. Available for all students, again, things like highlighters, notepads, line readers, the magnifier this year, which used to only go up to 200% or 200 times, is much, it enlarges it much more, up to 400 times. And so students who uh, had visual impairments that just it didn't magnify it large enough, now the screen is much bigger. The, the content on the screen is much bigger. Also available, that's available for all students. Also available for all students is text-to-speech in English. So again, we've been talking about reading the questions, reading, reading the prompts, the directions, the answers, etc. This is something that every student will have available. And because of that, because of the fact that students can click on the play button and at any point have it read to them, all students are going to need to have headphones so that this distraction from other of other people playing the text-to-speech voice isn't interrupting their testing. So that is something that's new and we're working on getting you some. I can't afford to buy every student a headphone, but please keep in mind that as schools, you have a budget, you may be able to get a classroom set and then just move it around. I'm hoping to get a classroom set as well for every one of you, um, and I'm working on that right now. Um, but keep in mind that you will need headphones um, in order to actually do this test. That's a big change. Now, if we move up the list, to where it says uh, to this yellow area, these are called designated supports. If you're going to provide a designated support, it's because a student needs this support. And it has to be recognized by the educator, by the teacher in the classroom, or by a team of educators. And it should be, when appropriate, with parent and student uh, input. Also, these are the tools that should be used on a regular basis in the student's classroom instruction. For instance, if a student um, has a, a something that they put over an overlay over text so that the color, the light uh, doesn't bother their eyes so much, for instance, um, that is something that they should be using on a regular basis and that would be masking or uh, contrasting colors, etc. Uh, these are examples of embedded uh, supports. Stack translations. Stack translations are kind of interesting because what that is is a translation of whatever's on the page in Spanish at the top, followed by the English version. So, for instance, on a page that is stack translations in Spanish. Um, it's Spanish only. That's the only option we have. So stack translations, it would read the directions. In, you'd have the directions in Spanish, directions in English, the prompt in Spanish, the prompt in English, the answer in answer A in English, Spanish, then in, in English. So it would continue like that. Um, we also have, as we're going to get to, uh, the stack translations have an option this year of being read text-to-speech in English or in Spanish. And we'll get to that more in just a moment. Non-embedded examples of designated supports, noise buffers. So if you students are distracted easily, a noise buffer would be great. Word-to-word -word dictionaries, et cetera. Uh, because text-to-speech is a, a universal support for all students, human readers are typically going to be fewer and far between because the students will have the ability to have the text read to them. So keep that in mind. We should have fewer human readers this year than we have in the past. All right, notes on stack translations. So stack translation can be uh, turned on with text-to-speech 
in English. So it would read the English text to the student, but it would have the, the Spanish translation that they could read themselves. Stack translations with text-to-speech in Spanish would read the Spanish text and they could look at the English words and read them themselves. You cannot flip between the two. So when you choose text-to-speech in English, that's gonna be it for that session of the test. If you choose text-to-speech in Spanish, that will be it. You cannot change in between uh, sessions or right in the middle of a session, or if a student says, no, I really think I wanted Spanish versus English, that's not an option. We can't do that. And so, again, we need to be thinking and planning about what is best for the student. They don't have to use the text-to-speech. They can. It will be available, but they don't have to. And this is a decision that's based on what's best for the student, and it's made at the school level, and that is something that will be in that roster sheet that you need to get information back to us. Okay, the last accommodation and support process are those that are very few and far between. These are actual accommodations that require an IEP or a 504, and they are not typical because if you look at these, the embedded ones, it could be something like video sign language or closed captioning. So most of the tools that students need can be found in either the universal or the designated supports. Other non-embedded things might be an abacus or a braille version or a multiplication table. So please keep that in mind, uh, but there are multiple versions uh, or multiple supports and accommodations, different levels, as well as embedded versus non-embedded. Okay. Um, I think we're going to just kind of move on. Uh, so this is a lot of information about the forward test. Next month, we're going to spend a lot more time on the forward test. Keep in mind that the websites are being updated. So on the left, you see the public facing page. On the right, you see the staff only page. And this these will be updated um, regularly as we get moving now closer and closer to the forward assessment. Okay. One last thing about forward. We have, as a district and as staff, as teachers, an opportunity to get involved and to learn more about this at the state level. Because of the changes this year in the, the assessment, DPI is looking for classroom teachers to help with three different things. Number one, range finding. Number two, standard setting. And number three, new item review. So if you have a staff member who might be interested in digging into this and learning more about the forward exam, this includes English as a second language teachers. It includes special edu education teachers. Um, they're looking for a lot of staff members to be able to be involved in here. The application process is pretty straightforward. Clicking on the link at the bottom of this page will get you to that particular page. And you can do that. It would be great if we had some MMSD staff involved in, in this process. Okay, dynamic learning maps. Getting really close to the end now. Uh, keep in mind that this is the alternate state assessment, as I mentioned. This is for grades 3 through 11. So not only the forward test, but also... Uh, Pre-ACT, ACT at the high school, this is the assessment for. It is designed, obviously, for grade levels and for those students who are getting uh, uh, their instruction aligned to the essential element standards. This will be, uh, will be sending out messages from the student services team as well as the assessment team uh, to case managers. Uh, if you have a student who needs the dynamic learning maps, we'll be sending that information out. If it hasn't already gone out, you'll be getting it soon. And that's regarding training um, and all the, the steps in the process. Okay, on the horizon, as we look forward, next month, we're going to be focused on professional development, what it takes to actually do the test. We'll be going through schedules. Uh, we'll be looking at the security agreements, what you need to sign off on, what your staff needs to sign off on. So all the details as we get closer and closer to uh, the 
18th of March date. So we'll have a meeting in February. We'll have one in March. So as we get closer, it'll be more about uh, the details and questions that you might have about the forward exam. And one of the questions we always get, and I keep bringing the same slide up every month, is opting out. Can families opt out of the test? And the answer is yes, for families can opt out of the forward exam. We need to have a couple of things. Number one, it needs to be that request needs to be from the family um, in writing, requesting opting out of of the forward exam, not just out of standardized testing, not just out of testing. It needs to say the forward exam. Um, when you get that, I don't want the original. Please scan it and attach it and send it to me. Or if it's an email, which is also perfectly fine, uh, send that on to both myself and Jamie Anderson. Um, the reason why I do this is because we need to report to the school board about the number of opt-outs on each exam. Who not, we don't send them a list of names, we, but we do um, break it down by how many opt-outs at every school. Uh, not a big deal, but just want to make sure that we understand what's going on. So please make sure if you have questions about opt-outs, um, you ask those as well. And I've got a document that's a, a shared uh, Google Doc that will have a place for you to ask questions and we'll be monitoring that document and hopefully get those to you, get those back to you and respond to you as quickly as possible. Again, our email addresses are listed here. We are looking forward to working with you on this. We know that it's a heavy lift, um, but we wanna make sure that you have the tools you need and you have places where you can go and get answers. So. With that, we're going to stop. I'm going to stop sharing, and I'm also going to stop recording. So please contact us if you have any questions uh, or any concerns, and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.